So today I would like to uh, talk about various analytical approaches uh, to the single cell RNA seq data. Uh, first, I will present several examples uh, from the data that I've been working with, and then I'll move to uh, some uh, additional, uh, more complex approaches. So first, uh, before I present the specific examples, I'll uh, mention the uh, data I've been working with. Uh, this is a project involving a, a single cell RNA seq uh, data obtained from IPF patients. And it's a joint project with uh, Dr. Ask's lab. We obtained uh, uh, access to three uh, data sets. The uh, first data set contains eight, eight donors and four IPF patients. The second one contains 10 donors and 12 patients. And the third one is the largest one. It contains uh, 29 donors and 32 IPF patients. The third data set is still being processed, so that's why I will not uh, talk about it today, but I'll be uh, talking about the first two data sets. After uh, obtaining the data, I processed it and then I defined the cell populations in the data. That's one of the uh, important steps in many of the projects involving single cell RNA seq. Not all of them, but in many of them. So, as you can see, uh, in the first data set, I found 13 cell populations, and in the second one, I found 31 cell populations. Uh, this different in numbers can be uh, due to uh, various reasons. Some of them can be technical, like uh, sample collection and some filtering, uh, some sorting of the cells, and some can be uh, technical from the analytical point of view. For example, uh, we know that the first data set is much smaller. It's about 40,000 cells, while the second data set has about 80,000 cells. So some of the populations they are too small to be identified in a smaller data set. That's why we don't have them. Uh, these plots on the right are actually showing the uh, cell populations that they found. The upper plot is TSNI plot. The uh, uh, bottom plot is the UMAP plot. The reason for them being different is because I was following the uh, guidelines uh, published in the source publications for these data sets. Both uh, TSNI and UMAP plots are actually uh, uh, quite similar to the uh, PCA presentation. So uh, each cell is a dot and the distance between the dots uh, indicates the uh, difference between the gene expression patterns between these two uh, uh, cells. So the uh, more distance, uh, distant are the dots, the uh, less similar the uh, gene expression patterns are. Uh, what we can see here are the different populations, so I'll just uh, mention them in short. So for example, here we have the macrophages, we have the AT2 cells, we have the basal cells, we have the dendritic cells, fibroblasts, and similar populations, uh, we have them here. So we have all the populations from uh, this data set here, but we have also additional ones. And now I'll move to specific examples. Uh, the first example is one of the uh, basic uh, steps we can take when we have single cell and seq data and we have defined our uh, populations of interest or just populations that we have there. So we can examine the expression of uh, certain uh, genes of interest. For example, here we have the CCL18, uh, which is a macrophage marker, and I'll show uh, what we can uh, do to see its expression in both data sets. So uh, this is the first data set, that's the second data set. On the left, you see exactly the same plots that we saw before. So these are just the cell populations. I didn't write all the uh, cell population names here, but I uh, wrote the important ones, as you'll see. Uh, this uh, plot is called feature plot. So what it does, it shows us the level of expression of the gene of interest. So uh, the high uh, expression is in purple and blue and the low expression is in gray. As you can see, we have a cluster here being highlighted and it's the macrophages, which is very reasonable to see uh, for the CCL18. For the second data set, we have this population and this small population. So the large population is the macrophages and the small one is the proliferating macrophages. The reason we didn't have it here was because it's such a small population that we couldn't really find it here. So in the first data set, we just don't have the population of the proliferating macrophages. However, these two plots, they're uh, qualitative. They're very important for us to see because uh, visually we can see whether we, can, we would like to continue in this direction but we would like also to do some uh, quantitative analysis. Uh, for that, uh, we would use the uh, violin plots. These are the plots shown here. So on the x-axis, we have the cell populations and the y-axis are showing the violins. So the violins are actually showing the distribution of the level of expression of the gene of interest. Uh, you can see the violin here and we have the black dots which are showing these uh, expression uh, levels uh, for each of the cells. 
As you can see in the upper plot, the only violin we can see is the macrophages, which uh, correlates uh, with this finding here. And in this plot, we can see both uh, macrophages and proliferating macrophages, which also correlates with the finding here. So that's a very basic approach, uh, but sometimes we would like to look at the co-expression of several genes. So I'll just show you the next example here. Here, um, it's a project uh, in work, so that's why I will not name the specific genes. I'll just name them as gene one and gene two. But what we're doing here is examining their co-expression. So first we have the two regular plots, the featured plots. So one is for gene one, uh, it's marked in red scale. And the other one is in, uh, for gene two, it's marked in the green scale. As you can see here, we have some expression of the gene two. Here we have the expression of gene, <coughs> sorry, gene one. Uh, the important part is this part. That's the co-expression plot. So as you can see, we see the gene one being expressed here, the gene two being expressed here. And if you, if you would have any uh, cells expressing both of them, they would be in yellow. We can't really see them here. However, we have to remember that we have 80,000 uh, points here in this plot. So it could be that we still have some cells, but we won't be able to just see them visually. And that's where the quantification comes in. And that's a very important part as well. Uh, so here, what we did, we just created a table counting the cells uh, showing different types of expression for these two genes. So uh, the first type of cells is the, uh, the cells that uh, don't have expression of gene one and don't have the expression for gene two. Then we have cells that are expressing gene one, but not gene two. We have the cells expressing gene two, but not gene one. And then we have cells expressing both. So actually, and that's a good example, I didn't provide the number here, but we did find some cells that were showing uh, expression of both genes. Once we have these cells, uh, one of the questions we can ask, for example, would be uh, to which population of cells do these cells belong? And that's what this uh, plot is showing here. So um, uh, let me just see. Uh, so here uh, we have on y, uh, sorry, on x axis, we have the cell populations again, and the bars are showing the number of cells uh, expressing both genes. So as you can see, the macrophages have the largest number of cells expressing both genes. However, it's very important to remember that the size of the cell population can vary a lot. For example, we have very large population of macrophages, but a very small population of uh, um, proliferating macrophages. That's why it's also very important to look at the percent and not just at the total and absolute number of cells. Oh, sorry. And that's exactly what we did here. So these numbers, they're showing the percent uh, of, cell, of cells expressing both genes out of each of the populations. So for example, when we see 2000 cells, uh, 2000 macrophages expressing both genes, it's only 7.5% of uh, macrophage cells in total. On the other hand, we see the smooth muscle cells here and the total number is very low. It's approximately 400 cells. However, uh, the cells that are expressing both genes, they constitute 40, uh, almost 43%. So it's also very important to look at these uh, things in percentage as well. Uh, next, and uh, now I'm going to uh, talk about uh, some uh, additional approaches. I don't have examples from our data for them, but I think they're very interesting and I hope that they will show you what else can be done. And these are also just examples because there are many, many uh, various approaches and algorithms developed for the uh, single cell RNA-seq. So here I'm bringing this example from a, a very different field. It's glioblastoma. But the reason I'm bringing it here is that we always can look at the other diseases and other fields to take some approaches because approaches can be universal. It doesn't really uh, uh, matter that they're coming from a different disease. So for example, here, the researchers were looking at the adult and pediatric glioblastoma. They did single cell uh, RNA-seq. And then uh, what they did, uh, because for uh, glioblastoma, there are four important states of the cells. Uh, they're listed here. I will not describe them. But the important part is that we have defined states and these states are defined by signatures. So what the researchers did, they got the signatures and they defined the uh, scores based on the signatures for each of the state that had a score. So the next step, what they did, they uh, actually uh, classified each cell based on these scores. 
And when they did that, they created this plot. So I'll just explain what it means. It's a very nice and pretty picture, but actually what it means, each corner is one of the uh, defined states and each cell from the experiment can belong, can have only one location on the plot. What they did, they uh, took uh, the maximal uh, score, so they would select for each cell, they would select the uh, state with the maximal score, and then uh, they plotted it as, uh, uh, as a relative difference from the other scores to show how different it is from the other scores for that cell. So what we have, we have a plot in the corners, we have the cells that are really in defined state, and then we also have a gradient. I think it's a very important point because in biology, in many cases, we don't really have just black and white picture. We don't have just the defined states. We also have gradients, and this approach captures these gradients as well. So once we have a gradient, we can actually superimpose the additional uh, characteristics of interest. For example, and that's the example here, that's what the researchers did. So this is the real plot, not the pretty picture. So they have the different states in the corners, and they also have all the gradients. What they did, they looked at the cell cycle. So uh, they, uh, they had a sig uh, cell sig uh, gene expression signature for the uh, cycling cells, and for each cell on the plot, they calculated how many neighboring cells were cycling, and that was the percentage they used. So for each cell, uh, they assigned a percentage of cycling neighboring uh, cells, and then they color coded it. So the uh, coding was from black to red. Red was the uh, high proportion of cycling cells, and you can see a pattern here. I think it's a very interesting approach because you can actually now examine additional uh, correlations with additional uh, characteristics to these uh, four states. And of course, for different diseases, we can define different states as long as we have the gene expression signatures. And uh, some of the additional approaches can be also finding clusters along the gradient, because, for example, we have some clusters here. We might have a cluster here. We might have a cluster here. So we can uh, find these clusters. There are different clustering algorithms to do that. And then we can look at the difference, at the biological differences between these uh, to uh, these clusters, like differential expression, like pathway enrichment. We can uh, do many, many various things. So I just wanted to show you this as an example of an approach that can be taken from a different field of research, but it's still applicable to almost any disease uh, you would like to apply it to. Uh, next, I'm going to talk about the trajectory inference and pseudo time. So trajectory is a sequence of gene expression changes each cell must go through as a part of dynamical biological process. A trajectory is a path, is a path let's call it that, and the pseudotime is a measure of how much progress an individual cell had made through that process. So where is it on the path, on this uh, trajectory? The important uh, point about this uh, analysis is that uh, if you want to uh, use a trajectory analysis, you have to make sure that your experiment actually is done in a way that the connection between data points within these cells can make biological sense. Uh, because uh, once you have a plot, the trajectory can be fitted to any plot. But if there is no biological meaning to that, then there is no meaning to the trajectory really. So for example, a experience that will be good for this type of analysis will be time series because you have different time points and know the sequence of the time points. And it can be differentiation experiments because they can also involve different stages of a differentiation. So this would be one of the, these would be good experiments to work with for the uh, trajectory inference and pseudo time. So uh, I took this example from the authors of the uh, algorithm. And what they did, they took a time series of whole developing uh, embryos and they selected only the neuron cells. And on the left, we have the UMAP plot. It's a similar plot to what we had, but as you can see, the cells are already aligning into, a, uh, into some kind of trajectory or paths. So what the researchers did, they uh, used their algorithm to uh, fit the trajectories. And it actually really made sense because they already knew the uh, direction because it was the time series. So they knew uh, what they would expect and it worked very well for them. Uh, uh, after you uh, do that, then you can actually also uh, uh, calculate additional things like pseudo time. So that would be the, uh, the distance the cell is located on, on the trajectory. 
Uh, I must uh, say that uh, there is an important limitation to the trajectory inference in pseudo time. It doesn't have directionality, and that's why we need to know the direction. So, for example, for the time series, it's very easy because we know what's the first time point and how it progresses. But that's why it's very important to know that the connection between the data point will make biological sense once we connect them, because as you can see, you'll always find trajectories here. Uh, next, I'll talk about an additional approach. Uh, it's called the Rene velocity. Uh, so uh, this one is a dire directional approach. It has directionality as well. Um, uh, in addition to other things it has. So it's a good approach to um, uh, to uh, work on experiments where you want to examine the developmental lineages or cellular dynamics. The RNA velocity is the first time derivative of the spliced mRNA abundance. And uh, it's based on the fact that with the bulk RNA seq and it's been shown for the single cell RNA seq as well. You can actually capture the unspliced mRNA and spliced mRNA. So the idea behind this approach is that when we have an increase in transcription rate, we would have an increase in the spliced mRNA, and that would lead to the increase in the spliced mRNA, and will continue to increase until we reach a steady state. When we have the uh, down regulation of transcription rate, we have a decrease in the spliced mRNA bound amount, and then we would have the decrease in the spliced mRNA, and it will go on till we reach a steady state again. Uh, this can be used. Uh, this shows us that the balance between the unspliced and spliced mRNA abundance can actually be important and useful to predict the future state of the mature mRNA abundance. And that in turn would be able to help us to predict the future state of the cell. So this is the theory be uh, behind the RNA velocity. I'll mention the types of visualization and then I'll just show an example because I think that just in words, it's a pretty abstract, uh, it's a pretty abstract um, approach. So uh, once we have the uh, we have uh, calculated the RNA velocity, the velocity is a vector. So we actually were having a vector field. So we can visualize it in different ways. It can be embedded in the uh, PCA plots, or it can be projected on the uh, low dimensional plots such as uh, TSNE or UMAP plots. Uh, since we have many, many, many points because we have many cells, we usually don't uh, plot each vector separately because that will be very messy and we won't be able to see the prevalent patterns. But what we do, we average the vectors. So we actually have a, a, a locally averaged vector fields instead. I'll just show you an example to show what it looks like there in a velocity. I think it's very interesting because what the, what it is, what we can see here, it's an example that the authors of the algorithm provided in their paper. And they're showing the branching lineage of the developing mouse hippocampus. Uh, first, here on the left, you can see the Chisney plot, uh, similar to the ones that I created previously for the IPF patients. We just see the different uh, cell populations and they're colored in different colors. Uh, once the RNA velocity was calculated, now we could actually project the vectors of the RNA velocity on this plot, and that's this result here. So what we can see, we can see these arrows. These are the uh, that's the vector field. So these are the average vectors and uh, we can see their length, the different length. The length of the vector would indicate the velocity. So the higher is the velocity, the longer is the vector. And the direction uh, indicates the direction. So what we can see here is that we have uh, two uh, main directions and that's what you can see here in the small insert. We have the direction going into these branches, this direction, and we also have the direction going here. So uh, when we go back to the uh, populations, we can see that that um, origin of the all these uh, velocities is the radial glia. And it's it's been known from other sources that the radial glia, they're actually they actually are the uh, their origin, their progenitors of the uh, of these other types of cells. So this uh, picture and this analysis, I think they uh, provide an evidence that such an approach can really work because you can really find how from one type you can develop to the others. What are the states? How do you go through the states? So uh, these are my examples for the uh, data analysis and approaches. And now I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kedel Ask for working with me on these projects and his students as well. 
and also for inviting me to uh, to present today. I was very happy that I could do that because I think that the single cell RNA seq is very important and it's a very promising uh, approach. If you have any further questions, uh, please uh, feel free to contact me uh, using this email. I'll be always very happy to answer any questions uh, you have. Uh, thank you.